everybody. I'm critically acclaimed author, Cousin Vinny Agnello. I wrote the classic, The Devil's Glove. And this is The Devil's Glove, at least our rendition of it. And uh, we're in the, we're doing the Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series tonight again. And uh, tonight, again, I'm dressed up as our protagonist, Billy Green, who Eddie Romano is about to meet in this chapter. Anyway, uh, at the end of this, we're going to do about 180 pages in, I don't know how many, 15-minute segments. But uh, enjoy the series uh, and see if you enjoy the book as much as all the fanfare that's followed it around the country. Probably the small published book of the year. And we'll give you a chance to buy it at a discount when this is all over. Enjoy yourself and thank you for welcoming me into your home. And this is... The uh, Devil's Club. We left off last night, page 72. I think I'll keep the Devil's Club right here with me. And uh, let us uh, begin. Uh, this is Eddie's mom talking. Either we're in his bedroom. Um, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but I really like your mitt. I felt like wringing your father's neck for bringing you to such a dangerous spot, but you two certainly were rewarded. I don't think I've ever seen a glove quite like that one. It is really cool. I don't think I've ever liked anything as much as I like it. I wouldn't sell it no matter what. It's so one of a kind. I, I can't believe how lucky I've been. I'm the luckiest kid in the whole world, Mom, Eddie declared as he jumped off his bed to give his mother a big hug. He added, I'm so happy that you love it too. I was never lucky enough to find anything like that. I'm sure that was somebody's pride and joy. I'm sure they would be happy that a nice boy like you found it. I know if I lost something special, I would want the finder to truly cherish it. I do, Mom. I do cherish it. Don't tell Dad, but it makes me dream, Eddie said while holding the glove proudly. Well, I don't want to disturb your dreams, so I won't wake you up until supper's ready at six, okay? Yeah, Mom, that would be fantastic. I'm starting to get sleepy right now. I can't wait to dream. I can hear my pillow calling for me. Good night, Mom. I love you. Good night, Eddie. Sweet dreams. Mrs. Romano whispered as she closed Eddie's bedroom door. Eddie held his glove against his heart and quickly fell into a deep sleep. He began to dream and saw numerous human faces flash through his mind until he was staring up at the most beautiful, most handsome face he'd ever seen. This must be a dream, he thought, but suddenly this handsome young man spoke to him. Eddie? Eddie, wake up. You're here, the handsome man in the old-fashioned Chicago White Sox uniform said. Where? Eddie asked in complete confusion. Well, you're with me. Who are you? Eddie questioned in amazement. I'm your coach. I'm your dream coach. A dream coach, Eddie asked in utter fascination. I've been waiting an awful long time for you, Eddie. So you're the boy who found my glove. Let me take a look at it. Wow, it hasn't changed a bit since the last time I saw it, the dream coach remarked. It hasn't? Just tell me one thing. Please tell me that you don't want to take it back, Eddie worried aloud. No, it's yours to keep, Eddie. I'm here just to teach you how to use it. It's magic. <gasps> I knew it! Eddie gloated. He then added, So you're going to teach me how to control the magic. You're going to be my new best friend, aren't you? That's right. Well, in that case, give me a hand up, will you? Certainly, the dream coach replied, dragging Eddie to his feet. Eddie looked around curiously at the abandoned stadium. The actual field was very well manicured, but the building itself 
was weathered with age. It looked like it must have been a place, a palace at one time, but somebody forgot to maintain it. The field's nice, but the place is a dump. Do you live here? Yes. Are you by yourself? At the moment, but that won't always be the case. Where do you sleep? I don't. Well, occasionally I do. That's not, all, that's not what I asked you. I asked you where you slept. Oh. Well, I sleep sometimes on the roof of the dugout and other times on the grass of the field. Don't you love the smell of freshly cut grass? Yes, I do indeed. It must be depressing to live here. It seems awfully dreary. Where's the sun? I don't know. I, I never see it. Look, let's not waste any more time with this chit-chat because I've got a job to do. I'm supposed to teach you how to play baseball like a real pro. Would you like to learn? There's nothing I'd enjoy more than learning how to be a great ball player. I just hope you realize I'm going to be a real project for you. I absolutely love the game, but I'm not very good at it. Maybe you could change that for me. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> that's why they pay me the big bucks. He stated this while looking at the dugout grimly. His voice had risen to a near shout by the time he reached the end of his gripe. I thought, nobody's here with us. Believe me when I tell you, nobody is. I guess that's what you call wishful thinking. Well, where do I begin? I, I guess we'll try to improve your hitting. Eddie and the dream coach worked on lots of fundamentals of hitting and fielding until Mrs. Romano created a cacophony by banging loudly on Eddie's bedroom door. The startling noise shocked Eddie back to reality. Suddenly he was swept away from that field of play back to the familiar confines of his bedroom. Wow! What a trip! Eddie screamed out as he arrived back in his bed. Are you coming down for dinner? Mrs. Romano urgently inquired. Then she obnoxiously added, If you are, you better hurry before your food gets cold. Hello? Earth to Eddie. Did you hear me? She asked while making more rude noises by slapping her hands together. Loud and clear. Give me a moment, will you? Eddie begged as he gathered himself mentally to go and enjoy dinner with his family. End of chapter. Next chapter. It's called A Newfound Confidence. Eddie and his teammates gathered together at the old high school practice field backstop. The field was a bit on the dilapidated side due to the constant use over the years. It was a familiar landmark for the Little Leaguers. Many of them had seen their older brothers play and practice on this same field during days gone by. Eddie hated the practice field because of the many rocks hidden within its sparse infield grass. They had a tendency to cause ground balls to bounce funny. On one occasion, the year before, he had a baseball take a bad hop off of one of them and strike him in the forehead. He recalled the embarrassment of going to school with a big knot in his forehead. Mr. Mitchell, the manager of the team, and his son Johnny traversed their way toward the practice field. Johnny dragged the team's equipment bag behind him and stopped to slap hands with all of his teammates except for Eddie whom he made a point of sneering at. Upon arrival, Mr. Mitchell told both Eddie and Billy Ray to grab their bats and start taking some batting practice. He told the rest of the team to go out and play the field. Are you sure that's necessary, Dad? I mean, look who's batting. Those two are hopeless. They couldn't hit the ball if their lives depended on it, Johnny snickered. Why don't you shut up, Johnny? I can hit the ball better than you can, Eddie asserted after overhearing the insult. What a laugh. This is the same kid who struck out on our last turn at bat. What can I say? Yeah, man, you're a real clutch hitter, <laughs> Johnny screamed out sarcastically. 
Johnny scrutinized Eddie while he was selecting a bat out of the equipment bag, and he paid special attention to the old green glove that Eddie was carrying. What's the matter, Eddie? Can't afford to buy a new glove? Where'd you get that one from? Let me guess. The Goodwill Industries? Johnny laughed boisterously. Keep on laughing, Johnny. This is a pro glove. And it happens to be magical. It's a lot better than anything you've got, Eddie boasted. Eddie, what are you doing with that glove? That glove is way too big for your hand. What happened to your other one, Mr. Mitchell inquired. It was autographed by Ryan Sandberg. So I'm using this one instead. Plus, this one's magical, Mr. Mitchell. I'm sure it's magical, Eddie, but it's too big for your hand, Mr. Mitchell said patronizingly. And it's a piece of junk to boot, added Johnny cruelly. Magical. What a joke. He screamed and chuckled for all to hear. Tell you what. I'll use it today. If I don't play well with it, then I'll bring the other mint next time, Eddie bargained. Eh, that's fair. Come on, let's get started. Stevie, you're on the mound. Keith, get behind the plate. The rest of you spread out. Stevie, give them the best stuff you've got. They're never going to improve if you give them gopher balls to hit because that's not what they'll be seeing during the games. Gotcha, coach, replied Stevie. The average size 12 year old pitcher started to warm up slowly, throwing the ball back and forth with Keith. With each toss, the velocity increased, and Eddie examined Stevie's pitching form with great interest. Eddie knew in the back of his mind that Johnny was right when he claimed to be the best hitter on the team, but since finding his magic glove, he felt a great confidence boost. Previously, he had always approached the batter's box with a feeling of imminent doom, but today, he actually felt like he could get a hit. His father always told him that he looked scared while standing in the batter's box. It was true. He was always afraid of being hit by a wild, fast pitch. But today, those fears for the most part subsided. Today, he stepped into the batter's box fearlessly. Mr. Mitchell immediately noticed a difference in Eddie's uh, approach. He looked confident. He looked like he owned the dish. He was astonished to see Eddie crowd in the plate. As he looked on, he took mental notes on how completely changed the boy's approach to hitting had become. All he could do was keep repeating, Wow, Eddie, you're looking so much better. Stevie noticed the difference, too. Stevie recalled how his father told him explicitly that if a hitter ever tried to crowd the plate, he was to throw at him. Stevie sensed that Eddie was trying to take control of his turf. So he followed his father's instructions to the letter and reared back and threw a fastball at Eddie's head. Eddie jumped back just in the nick of time and fell onto the seat of his pants. He got, got up, dusted himself off, and stood in the same exact position in the batter's box he occupied before. Watch the bean ball, Stevie, Mr. Mitchell warned, and then added, Way to hang in there, Eddie. Stevie reared back and threw another fastball. This time it ended up a foot outside. Why don't you uh, try throwing the ball over the plate, Eddie asked in a surly tone of voice while pointing his finger at the plate. Stevie was immediately enraged. He was the best pitcher on the team and one of the weakest hitters had just directed a derogatory remark in his direction. At that moment, the only thing on his mind was that Eddie Romano was not going to make him look foolish. He was going to put a quick end to this tough guy routine. Come on, Stevie. You don't have to pitch to him carefully. He's a whiffer. He's always been a whiffer. Strike this bum out, Johnny screamed out obnoxiously. Stevie was taking too much time getting ready, so Eddie stepped out of the batter's box and walked over and picked up his magic glove. He gave it a quick kiss and set it down and returned to the batter's box. Stevie sneered over at Eddie and spit intimidatingly in his direction. 
Stevie wound up and pitched a letter-high fastball over the middle of the plate, and, had, and Eddie hit it with the sweet spot of the aluminum bat barrel. The ball took off as if it was fired from a rocket launcher and soared over the left fielder's head. Eddie stood and watched the flight of the ball in complete amazement. Never in his entire life had he hit a ball any harder. Superstitiously, he retreated back to his glove and kissed it again. He then marched back into the batter's box. Stevie, pitch me another one just like...